Okay, so the first thing to set up the rebreathing demonstration, um, for, at the moment we have to use this computer here, which is uh, uh, a little mini Apple computer. Um, we're trying to get the software rewritten so that it can be used on any computer, but at the moment that software is only on this computer and we don't know the components that need to be installed in order to use it somewhere else. So, so this is the computer that has to be run. Um, to make it run on, uh, to make it project on the on the classroom computers, uh, there's an adapter to a HDMI cable. Uh, I'm going to hold it next to the camera so you can see it. So there's that adapter, and it goes from digital to HDMI, and so that's what. Uh, that's what we need to use to, in order to project the, um, the result from this computer up onto the big screen. At the moment, we're just using this small monitor, so it's a different cable in the back, but just so, just so we know. Um, the components that we need uh, are, the, uh, are the flow meter. So this big black box here attaches to the flow meter. And so when we're using it, we'll turn that on. Oh, that's just for the flow meter, that's not, not this bit. Um, so yeah, so, so we turn on the flow meter and that will just measure the, the volume of the breaths in and out. Uh, that's another thing that I'd like um, uh, uh, to oh, have the ability to calibrate because we, we check that it's reading three liters, say, um, in the other spirometry pods, but we never have for this no. and I'm sure that's not accurate at all. But anyway, um, now the other, uh, so the other component that we need is this little box here. So this is an integration box. This takes the place of a power lab. So we don't need any power labs for the demonstration, just this box here. So this takes the data from the various uh, machines and puts it all together and then sends it to the computer, um, which the software then uses to, to make the graphs. So this integration box just has four inputs and one output, so the output is the USB to the computer. The inputs, two of them come from the gas analyzer, so on, labeled on the box is four, three, two, and one. So into four and two are the two inputs from the gas analyzer, and number four is the oxygen, number two is the CO2. The flow head comes from the black pneumatac box and that gets plugged into port three. And the switch for the restriction switch on the, on the bell jar goes into port one. The pneumatac is just this, um, is, it says pneumatac there. It's just this um, flow head uh, uh, black box there. So that's, Port number three, as it's labelled on the box, port number three is what that plugs into. And that, so that goes from pneumatac out on that box to pneumatac in, uh, which is on this box here. And the last one is the, um, the switch for, the, uh, for the, um, the restriction handle. Um, so they're all the things plugged into that. Um, The gas analyzer is uh, pretty much like all our other uses of the gas analyzer. So basically we just turn it on, leave it to warm up, and there's a pump on it which actually draws air into it. So it actively samples the air, and you have to choose what, what fan control to use, but we've sort of just got about halfway at the moment. And the sampling tube just plugs into the side of the mouthpiece of the bell jar. Now, um, uh, the other thing that we usually have set up is the mouthpiece. We've generally, oh, not generally, we always sterilize the, uh, the mouthpiece using 80% ethanol, 80% volume to volume ethanol. Um, and then usually we just wrap a tissue around it so subsequent dust and stuff doesn't drop on it and the student feels reassured that you know, it's been cleaned as opposed to just sucking on something that all the other students have sucked on. The, the bags that we use are 35 litre um, garbage bags, but they have to be the really cheap ones. The expensive brand name ones are all fragranced and it just makes it nasty to have to breathe in and out this fragrant, sickly sort of perfumed air. Um, so we always get the cheap bags because they're, they're unperfumed, which is what we need. 
Now, putting in the bag is difficult, or rather, the consideration for putting in the bag is how much bag do you put in? You don't want to have so much bag in there that it fills up to such a volume that it takes ages for the CO2 levels to go up. So, um, so that's one consideration, but you do need to put enough in that the student, um, uh, that their lungs aren't bigger than the volume of the bag. Uh, I've put it in for myself before and I didn't have enough volume in there and every time I breathed in, it would suck the bag flat and then I'd struggle to sort of get in enough volume. Um, so, uh, so I had limited myself in that way. So you, you sort of got to try to guess how much volume the student needs and also, um, but not make that volume too large that, uh, that, you, uh, that it takes too long for the CO2 to rise. So usually what I do, when the bag's flat, what I, how I gauge it, is when the bag's flat, I try to have it just touch the bottom of the, of the tank, because that's a fixed volume and that's sort of roughly, roughly the size that we need. So the, the long arm of this valve here points towards the part that's blocked off. There's three inlets to this valve. There's the mouthpiece, there's this external nozzle here, and then there's the nozzle that goes down into the bag. You can turn one of them off at a time, and the long axis of this handle points to the one that's currently turned off. Um, so that, that isn't opened, uh, opened up here in this, um, in this valve. So at the moment, the mouthpiece is open through this port here, which means the bag is closed off. And so that's pointing down here. When we want the student to breathe through the bag, we'll turn this upwards. So then the long handle will be pointing at this valve here. So now the, the mouthpiece is open to the bag. So it's this nozzle that's turned off. Now this is the rebreathing gas. To, uh, to minimize the risk of putting the wrong gas in the bag. So we don't want to put an asphyxiant gas in the bag. It always needs to be something that is capable of supporting life. Having 93% oxygen is fine. So the rebreathing gas is fine in the bag. Pure oxygen would be fine in the bag. Um, but there's calibration gases and other gases that we use which have a very low oxygen concentration. So you don't want that ever going into the bag by accident. And so we put these big green stickers with rebreathing gas on it. And so every single time that you check um, that you're just as you're about to put this in the bag you always check that says rebreathing and I even check that the real um, the real sign on it says um, says oxygen um, here we've got a medical gas mixture uh, written on the side and it says 7% um, CO2 in oxygen so I know that there's going to be enough oxygen regard just in case someone stuck the wrong sticker on there I know that it's still the right one um, and uh, sometimes in some classes we have multiple gas tanks so again when when you're putting this in if I'm just about to turn that on I'll just, again just make sure that it's the rebreathing gas that I'm putting in here so you, you can't ever um, get the wrong gas into the bag this particular style of regulator lets you dial flow um, and it can go up to 15 liters per minute um, it's because it goes through so many switches, you sort of sit there swiveling it around for a while to get it on and off, and then you have to go all the way up to here. So it's a little bit easier to control the gas flow um, using the on-off valve, um, valve here, because a, a, a fraction of a turn is on, a fraction of a turn is off. Um, so you just set it to the flow. What I do is you, I set it to the flow rate that I want, and then just turn the tank on. Uh, and then it's, just, it's a bit easier to control the flow of the gas then. Once the gas is flowing, you should be able to see the, uh, the gas filling up the bag, which it is. So once the student's selected, then we usually take the tissue off um, again, so the student can see that we've uh, taken, uh, that we've put them in front of a clean mouthpiece. And then the student sort of arranges themselves on the chair, raises the chair, lowers it, whatever they need to, so that they can sit comfortably with a straight torso uh, and have their mouth sort of line up at the, the mouthpiece. You don't want to sort of bend the, the mouthpiece overly in either direction, otherwise it sort of tends to pull the, the stop out of the bell jar a little bit. Um, so I usually get the student to sort of um, dip your mouth onto there and get breathing, reminding them that the, um, 
the air is currently they're currently breathing room air, so um, so they can sort of just get used to breathing on the mouthpiece and relax for just a sec, while I then go to the computer and um, turn on the uh, the rebreathing software if it's not on already. So the rebreathing software is turned on by this little shortcut here, saying shortcut to breath. And so you just double click on that. You need the person breathing through the flow meter um, before you turn on the software, before you press start on the software. So I'm going to turn Hala over to the bag now. Um, now you turn them over to the bag after they've breathed out. So I'm watching the students breathing and at the end of an expiration, then I switch over to the bag. So I turn off this port and now the breath is going down to the bag. And now, um, because the breath is going into the bag, the tidal volume is going in and out of the flow meter, and so the machine will start to detect it. And so now I can press start on the software. Now on the software, the first thing you check, because um, this shows that everything's all right, CO2 should be around 50, um, 50 55 millimeters of mercury of CO2. And O2 is usually around 500 millimeters of mercury when they just when they first get started. Which it is, so that's that's looking good. I usually let them go for a, for a few millimeters of mercury. So we started off at around 57. So if we go up to around say 50, uh, 52, oh sorry, 62 millimeters of mercury, then that's a rise in about five millimeters of mercury. Um, before we do the first restriction, just to get a, a sampling of data before we do the first constriction. So we're at about 62 now, so I'm just gonna close the, close the, uh, the restriction valve. The red, um, the, the software should show red, showing that it's detected the, the closure of the, um, of the switch. And then you, let, uh, you sample at least five breaths. The computer is hopeless at detecting these first breaths because they're not big enough, we think. Um, so even if you do six breaths, that's fine. And usually the student's quite comfortable at this stage because the CO2 is not overly high. Um, so they're, they're still like, feeling all right, whereas later on they're feeling a little bit short of breath and they have to work against the restriction. So, um, so sometimes that one's a, a little bit more of a challenge for them. Now during the demonstration, I always remind the student how much oxygen they have. So they're going to start feeling short of breath. It's going to feel a little bit funny breathing a different mixture than what they're used to. Um, so I always remind them that, uh, that the air in the room is 160 millimetres of mercury, but they're currently breathing 460 millimetres of mercury. So there's at least three to four times the amount of oxygen that they're getting that everyone else in the room is getting. So anything they're feeling is due to the CO2, not due, not due to loss of oxygen. And that just reassures the student that what they're feeling is normal. So the CO2 levels have gone up 10 millimetres of mercury. We usually try to finish around 75 millimetres of mercury. So I'm going to do the second restriction now. Now the breaths are usually a bit longer and slower. Oh, sorry, they're a bit longer and deeper, trying to get more oxygen in. But the restriction um, sort of prevents them from doing that. So, that it, so it is a bit more of a struggle. We still need five breaths. These, sec these second restriction breaths usually get detected more easily than, uh, than the first ones. So that restriction is usually, usually good for this demonstration. After the second restriction, we usually try to let it go up maybe, maybe one, maybe two millimeters of mercury. So we stopped at about 75, 76. So we'll wait to 77. So we've got that little bit of extra data, which lets the software automatically plot it a little bit more easily. 
So once the, once the CO2 gets up to where we need it to, then we just press stop breath before the student stops, and then we sit, uh, tell the student that they can just come up with the mouthpiece whenever they're ready. So now once, um, so we've pressed the stop button, and, um, and the class is now sitting and listening to the lecturer. So while the lecturer is talking and usually asking the subject some questions, what we then do is just bring up the, the results. Now, if all goes well, we just press the analyze button and the software then takes the data and analyzes it. So it should bring up four graphs. And what we're looking for is there should be a bunch of red data here and a bunch of red data here and a red line between them. If that doesn't occur, then we need to quickly shut all of those down before anyone notices and then bring up the emergency data. Um, so the, uh, the, the data that we've prepared earlier. Can you? And I'll, so I'll shut that down and open up the new data in just a sec to show you how to do that. But uh, let's just have a look to see what goes wrong with the software at the moment. So in figure one is where the breaths are detected. I'm gonna make that bigger. It's a bit easier to see. And so the restriction breaths, for some reason, are often not detected. And from what I've, um, I, I don't think I've saved any of that other data, sometimes when the students are breathing and they've just gotten there, so their breaths are still quite small, they're not detected either. So what I think is going on is that um, there's a, a rate or a, a volume sort of limit on this detection algorithm and breaths lower than that aren't detected. So this one here is detected. So, so it looks like anything lower than that's not being detected. But why then this one isn't detected, I, I, I just don't know. So we don't know what's going wrong with it, it's, but it always does it. And it's um, in recent years, it's become so unreliable that you almost never get a good set of data. And I don't know why. So in class, when all those graphs come up, this one will be the fourth and final graph that comes up. If there's no red line there, you just immediately shut them all down so that people don't notice that that's happened. And you just click load data. The default screen that comes up is this one. And I've got a series of data um, which goes and uh, the, the first number is the time that it took. So you took 263 three seconds. Um, usually we don't fill the bag quite that much and so it wouldn't have lasted that long. And so you look for the time and usually it's around 180. I try to go for about three minutes. Um, and we usually try to finish around 75 millimeters of mercury um, of CO2. So this went from, 50, uh, from 60 millimeters of mercury like yours did up to say 75, which again yours did. Um, so we would click on this because that shows the right CO2 concentrations. We then click analyze and so having loaded that data we then click analyze and then it does exactly the same thing but with that data and for some reason that data detects um, if we go back to graph one the two restrictions here and here have both been detected so on graph four um, the red line now appears and that's what we're after for this demonstration that's probably one of the main things because it's showing that uh, the, the minute ventilation, so the amount of the volume of air respired per minute, uh, even though they're putting in more effort with the restriction, you're actually getting less air in. Um, the, the CO2 level still, oh, sorry, the CO2, as CO2 rises, which is what's being shown here on the x-axis, the minute ventilation is still increasing, but you'll notice that the line is shallower than the unrestricted line. So two things are happening. The, um, the amount of, the, the volume of air respired per minute is less during restrictions, even though the students are working harder. Also, the compensation for the increase in CO2 is less. So the, the line is shallower, it's less steep than the un, uh, when it's restricted versus unrestricted. So those are the two things that they're going to show in that demonstration. So that's why we need both lines. Um, and that's how you show it. So you open up this extra data if, if you're unlucky and the one that you had, uh, the student you had sitting in the chair didn't work. Then the, um, so once you bring all those up, the, the uh, lecturer will then get you to show the different ones. And first of all, they usually show figure one, which is this one. And because they want to show um, initially the, the breaths are sort of a particular height. 
later on they're higher, showing that the volume has increased, the depth of the breaths have increased. Also per unit time, so here for example one square has three breaths, down here they've got five breaths, so they're breathing faster as well, the rate of breath is faster as well. And they'll want to show the students the, the two restrictions. Unfortunately the first one's not particularly clear on this one, but um, the second one's clear enough. Uh, they usually skip over figure figure two and just show this one and this one shows time um, and CO2 concentration. So this shows the rate of concentration production basically in the body. So it's the amount of CO2 their metabolism is generating just by sitting there. And so they, they almost always show this graph and they show the, the breaths from the restriction here and here. And then they'll get you to bring up this graph, which is the, the main take home message where they show those things that we mentioned before. Now, sometimes in some classes or in some years, they didn't this year actually, but in some years they get they want you to um, to produce a copy of, of um, these graphs to give the students. Yeah. Uh, now I forget, do we explore? I can't remember whether I just screen captured it or whether I actually exported. Oops. Should they export this MATLAB to this guy? No, no, as a JPEG. So, um, so I'm just going to do this to desktop so we can see it. Um, so. JPEG and go to desktop just so I can find it. And we'll call test the kind of round figure four, I think I one. said. Or was it one that I was doing? Oh no, this would be figure four. Yeah, I think I've got it on the top, so we do that. So I've got Hala test figure four, so let's just save that and have a look. See what it looks like. Show desktop. Put it. There so that's the figure file. Yeah. And so that's the graph. So you would just save as JPEG and save each of the four images, um, and you can put them into a um, into a file. So I just had a thought. Some, so I don't, if I'm doing that, I'll often compile those four images into a single PDF document because it makes it a little bit easier to handle. But I think I usually, I don't think Acrobat's installed on this computer, in this little old Apple computer. So I think what I usually do is take those four images off the, um, off the desktop, for example, uh, and then in Acrobat on a normal computer, um, I'll make a single PDF out of them and then um, and then the lecturer will then upload that to Canvas for the students. But they don't always need that, so we don't, don't necessarily need to do that. The, the lecturer will say if they want a copy given to the students. Thank you. Yeah. All right.